So you have to make sure that you catch those mistakes initially. Tell your contractor, these are the mistakes that you have been doing so far. Please correct them, right? Before it's too late. Welcome to the Building Wealth Through Real Estate Podcast, where we talk all things real estate investing, demystifying the investing process so that you can start growing your real estate business. I'm your host, Al Ray Noble, and joining us today, we have Mr. Varshit Patel. So firstly, could you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and where your real estate business is currently at? All right. So uh, I'm, I'm a a real estate investor based in uh, Edmonton area, which is in uh, Alberta, Canada. Uh, I like came to Canada as a student, right? Uh, so I was in, I was studying in Toronto uh, as a student, and then uh, after I graduated, uh, I was like Alberta was on boom at that point of time, right? A lot of yeah. oil and gas industries was uh, uh, hiring a lot of people, so I decided to move over. So I started uh, working in my IT career which uh, till uh, till current date, I'm still working full-time in IT. Uh, uh, so for the real estate business, uh, it all started with the pandemic, right? Uh, during the pandemic, I had have, every one of us had a lot of time, right? Uh, to rethink what was going in our, on our life. Um, I had been investing in uh, what you call stock market before, which I still uh, do invest in. Uh, but while during the pandemic time, when you were not uh, allowed to meet many people. I used to listen to a lot of podcasts and uh, following social media and everyone, everything. So at that point of time, uh, I, I got into uh, listening to real estate podcasts and uh, that, that basically hooked me up uh, with the real estate thing, right? So since then, I started uh, joining a lot of networks, uh, networking with other you know, like-minded investors in Edmonton. And yeah, since then, I started investing in real estate. Uh, I'm currently focusing mainly on the uh, birth strategy, and then uh, I'm also doing some uh, wholesaling and uh, agreement for sales strategy on the side. Oh, great, great! So it seems yeah. like you 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 jumped in pretty quick. You know, you started learning and you just started taking action. So that's and that that's um, actually uh, so many people I've listened to, even on podcast, on the YouTube videos, uh, reading so many books. Um, so many people say that, yes, education is definitely necessary, but until you take the action, you would not learn uh, anything, right? So, uh, I, and I, I, those those investors who have uh, recommended me to take actions, uh, they, have, they are big time investors as well, right? So I, I took leap of faith there and then I just jumped right into it and and they were right. I think if, uh, I don't know how many books or how many podcasts I have, uh, I have done, uh, like if, if I have done so many books or podcasts, I couldn't have learned what I learned uh, using the uh, the real real life uh, what what goes on with me. Oh, one hundred percent. I completely agree. That's the best yeah. way to learn. I mean, get some education so you know somewhat of what you're doing, but then jump in and actually that when that's when the learning actually begins, right? Exactly. Yeah. So exactly. so so you said you focused on the the birth strategy. So that's yep. the for our listeners out there who don't know what that is. That's buy, rehab, rent, refinance, and then repeat. Um, I think correct. let's break down each part of the strategy, going over how the process worked mm -hmm. uh, for you, and then any obstacles you encountered and how you were able to overcome them. Okay. If that works. Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So so first is is the buy. How do you find this property? Well. My perfect scenario would be to buy these properties off market. Uh, but uh, during this time, uh, so I was buying, uh, when, when I bought my property, it was COVID frenzy, right? Everyone thought that it's not going, like our real estate market is going to slow down. And then uh, for first couple of months, it was uh, slowing. But then all of a sudden, when interest rate uh, started going down, people started paying a lot of money in there. And during that time, there were not a, not a lot of off-market deals, so to speak, in the market. Uh, yeah. So uh, I was not finding anything off-market, and that's the reason I, uh, I, I went to, through a realtor. So what uh, the first thing, uh, first of all, uh, getting into the real estate, one thing I would always uh, recommend any, any new investors who are uh, starting to invest into real estate is build a good team, right? So uh, uh, ha having good uh, part, Good members in your team, such as a good realtor, 
uh, a mortgage broker, and then uh, insurance agent. Uh, those people uh, should be in your team, and and they should be knowing about real estate, right? You cannot just pick any realtor uh, uh, who doesn't know a different real estate strategy. So you have to go with the uh, those realtors or or any any of those person for that matter, who mostly deals with real estate uh, investors, right? So. So what I did is I reached out to uh, a real estate agent who were focused on who was focused on uh, investors specifically, and then I started uh, uh, MLS. Uh, I, I basically we did MLS, uh, what you call filtering, right? So we had a one-on-one -on -one call for half an hour just to understand uh, what were my requirements kind of stuff. So we set up a, a search criteria, and having the after that search criteria was created. I was getting lots of deals through MLS, right? So for the first buy that I did uh, for the bird, uh, it was through the MLS uh, listing. Okay, and uh, for interest, like how long from the time that you set up that um, that search to when you actually found the deal? How long did that take? So uh, uh, I was basically uh, uh, ready to pull the trigger uh, within within one month, right? Uh, so what happened is I put uh, since I still created the search criteria. I put offer on uh, two properties, uh, but again, at that point of time, uh, it was uh, uh, during the COVID frenzy, people were uh, putting, uh, we were having a lot of multiple offers and people were putting yeah. thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 above asking, right? And now it, it is normal in different parts of Canada, such as Toronto, Vancouver, all those, all those cities have seen something like this, right? In, in areas like Edmonton, uh, this was something new, uh, at least, uh, uh, at least during my real estate career. So, so I did put offer on uh, two properties. Uh, it didn't go through because there were uh, higher um, offers on those ones. So, but it, it within three months though, with the, the, okay. the since the day uh, we searched the uh, put the search criteria within three months, uh, I was able to close on this property. Oh, great, great! And and what sort of things were you looking for when a potential deal crosses your path? What was the criteria like? Property type, area, price point, etc. So, uh, uh, with the uh, with the burst strategy, so uh, if you want to do burst strategy, uh, there are two ways you can go about it. Uh, let's say if it's a, a like very uh, appreciative market, right? In those markets, what you can do is you can have uh, you know, a property distressed property for for that matter, and then you can just do cosmetic renovations and just put it back on the market. Uh, but uh, but but do the markets which are not uh, very appreciative or uh, such as Toronto, Vancouver, those those kind of cities. Uh, what you have to do for, in order to do successful burst is you have to uh, you have to do a uh, forced appreciation by putting something new in this property. So when I started looking for the properties, the criteria that I was using was uh, was was something where I can do two units in one property, right? So I was mainly looking for a, a single family detached bungalow which already has a side entrance, right? And then uh, so if, if you have that, then you can put a legal basement in them so that you can rent out upstairs and downstairs. So what you're doing essentially is you're doing a force appreciation on that uh, property. And by doing that, you can get higher price value um, well, to do uh, the future birth, like future steps of the birth, uh, so to speak. Absolutely, absolutely. And yeah. then, of course, you increase your your monthly income in there and, and, and your, your cash flow as well. So. Perfect. Certainly. Always, always a good strategy. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. How are you choosing which areas work best for the strategy? Like what factors are you considering when you narrowing down the specific neighborhoods that you want to keep an eye on? Uh, so in terms of uh, area, um, when, when I created my search criteria, I was pretty open to any areas in Edmonton, area, uh, Edmonton, so Edmonton and surrounding cities or so surrounding okay. uh, towns, so to speak. And then I, I just uh, asked my realtor to, uh, that there are few pockets in Edmonton where I wanted to stay away from. So I was not uh, focusing on those ones, but I was pretty open. Uh, I didn't have, I did have my favorites, but uh, just by having, because what, what happens is uh, what the favorites that I have, uh, other people have the same favorites as well, right? So yeah. in that case, yeah. it basically create, uh, increases your competition. So I was pretty open. Uh, open to all the area but uh, let's see if i uh, if i want to do it uh, again uh, my favorite area in edmonton who, who knows this uh, city uh, millwoods is a good area west edmonton and uh, in the north side if i have to do near grease bar uh, which is uh, uh, the upcoming community there that's that's the 
around the Greece area. That's that's what I focus mainly on. But again, I'm pretty open to uh, the, as long as numbers make sense. I do not shy away from going into other areas. Okay, good to know. Good to know. Yeah, and uh, uh, one uh, other stuff that I was looking at uh, is uh, uh, mature neighborhoods, right? Which had uh, uh, shopping shopping areas nearby, schools, some recreational uh, uh, recreational uh, facilities, and then uh, good uh, uh, bus services or bus network, so that uh, if if family with kids uh, move in, or let's say if uh, if young students move in, right, it's easier for them to yeah. travel uh, if, if, if they don't have cars. So. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All, all good things to consider when, when, when uh, narrowing down uh, exactly. the neighborhoods. Exactly. Um, and, and one more thing I forgot to yeah. mention is zoning. Yeah, so zoning is so, the, yeah. the important, yeah. So zoning is the most important thing because you don't want get to in, get into a situation where, um, you want a property and you have everything lined up. You want to put a basement suite. Uh, you apply for a, for a permit and city comes back to you and then uh, says that, oh, you cannot put a basement in here because the, the zoning doesn't allow you to do so, right? So so that's that's that was one of the other stuff that I also look forward to if, uh, if zoning uh, allows you to put those secondary suites in there. Oh, yes, definitely. That, I think that's a key aspect, especially if you want to add yes. the secondary suite is know the zoning before you go ahead and uh, oh, yeah. pull through the property yeah definitely yeah, you don't want definitely. you don't want to get burned there no no yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah so so since the buying portion is probably the most important one mm-hmm. um did you negotiate to get um to get it at the right price to make it work i mean i know at this stage the market was quite hot mm-hmm. um but were there any negotiations that took place or was it just priced at at the right price where you could still just make it work I don't buy anything without uh, negotiating. Negotiating. Not, not, yeah, not, not only real estate, but anything I I, I always uh, try to negotiate, right? Sometimes it yeah. works, sometimes it doesn't work, but uh, unless and until you ask, you're not going to get something, right? So Absolutely. Uh, with this one, though, uh, what happened, because as I mentioned, uh, the real estate market was crazy at that point of time. People were putting thirty, forty thousand dollars 40000 above asking. So yeah. uh, because of that, uh, I was able to negotiate, but not much. It was around uh, 3000 bucks or something like that, right? Uh, okay. But it was, uh, uh, according to the market, uh, $3,000 was good enough. But uh, in future, if I have to negotiate on this property, I would definitely be able to get a lot more discount at, uh, where the current market is. Oh, yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So I guess, I guess it just, it wasn't priced far off. Um, what you were looking for to make to make the whole strategy work anyway, right? Yes. So it was uh, the criteria that I had. The purchase price was within that criteria. Uh, uh, so even without ne- uh, negotiating, the the price was still without uh, within the criteria, right? And and if I have to give a tip, uh, right? Sometimes what happens is sellers are not keen to negotiate on the on the prices. So what you do is you go through your inspections. And most of the time, whenever you buy whenever you buy a property. And when you go through an inspector, which is, uh, again, a, a, a very crucial member of your uh, real estate real estate investing team, you, ha- you need to know uh, a nice uh, uh, inspector who has been doing this thing for the long time. So you go through inspection, right? And uh, 99% of the time, there will be a few things that will come in the inspection report. And you can take those inspection reports. So those points, negative points that comes out of those inspection reports, and use leverage them to uh, negotiate uh, the pricing. That is a great strategy, yeah. Because yeah. when when they go and they complete the inspection, they're looking for anything and everything that's possibly wrong, no matter how big or small. And I mean, even if the house is relatively new, there's always something that they'll find. So there's exactly. always something in the inspection that you can use. So it's it's a great tip. You you get in out there, and then once the inspection is done, you can then at that point um, leverage that to negotiate. That's a great tip, actually. Yeah. You would be surprised uh, 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 hearing that it's not only the old houses who have, which has the uh, inspection issues, right? Uh, I, I've seen many, like I've talked to inspectors, they said that many, many of the times uh, uh, the new houses that uh, that were bought like six months ago and they come up with the inspection, like uh, decrepance, uh, uh, discrepancies in the inspection, right? So those things yeah. definitely are not only um, for the older property. So whenever if you buy a property, I would always recommend to go through an inspection so that 
it eliminates any guesswork from your side. Yes, exactly, exactly. And uh, I know we still get into the 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 rehab part, but it at least gives you an idea on 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 working out your rehab budget, what you're going to need to fix. Um, you know, going yeah. through with this property. Exactly. Tell me, um, how did you pay for this one? How uh, did you finance savings. it? Savings. Savings. Okay. Yeah, savings okay. was uh, mainly uh, the savings, and there was some part of uh, the equity uh, on my primary residence, right? But mostly it was savings that I used uh, you know, to pay for this property. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So part savings and then part uh, um, home equity line of credit on that. Yes. Exactly. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. And then were there any obstacles that you faced with regards to either finding the deal or closing it, closing on it? Uh, closing was pretty smooth. Uh, finding, uh, I think it was uh, because of the crazy well. market, right? Uh, for people, was it's just the multiple offers. Those that was the only thing uh, that was uh, basically uh, difficult during the process. Otherwise, the uh, process was pretty straightforward. Um, what we ended, of course, uh, I put offer on two other properties, and they uh, like I was not able to get it. Because uh, most of the time, what happens is when we go through a real estate uh, a real estate uh, purchase. Uh, you usually go with the one thousand dollars deposit or you know, five thousand dollars deposit, right? So, uh, just to show uh, that you are serious buyer, you know, what we did at that point of time is I increased my deposit to twenty five thousand dollars. So I said that I'll put twenty five thousand dollars down. I'm interested in purchasing the property, right? So if they have a multiple offer situation, one you know, with one thousand dollars deposit versus twenty five thousand dollars deposit, they know who is the serious buyer, right? And that's when uh, they'll pick you. So, uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, other, uh, like apart from multiple offer and crazy market, there was not, uh, there were not a lot of difficulties, uh, and, and the difficulty that I was getting, I basically, uh, just put larger deposit up front, uh, so that, uh, to represent, to present myself as a serious buyer. That's a great strategy. Cause I was just about <laughs> to ask you, given the fact that the market was hot, uh, were you competing with other offers on this property and, um, did that affect your 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 negotiating like you know you you're probably less pushy to to negotiate lower knowing that the market's hot and there's multiple offers but um that's a great strategy it's just coming mm -hmm. serious put, put down a big deposit and mm -hmm. um especially people who have been burned who've, who've had like uh, other offers come in and you know maybe they fall through because of financing or whatever mm -hmm. sometimes they just want to get the sale over and done with so they'll choose someone with a higher deposit Maybe mm -hmm. less of a of a offering price versus someone with a low deposit that's offering a bit more as well. So yes, yeah. and and one more thing, I actually I forgot to mention this that uh, this property I was uh, looking at this property for a long time. Uh, this property was actually uh, pending when I started looking into it, and usually with the pending, they have a certain amount of days that they have to uh, uh, close on a property. So it was a yeah. pending and uh, I was, as I said, I had that realtor search. Uh, so I was getting emails pretty much every day. And all of a sudden, this property came into my inbox. And I was like, I've seen this property before, right? So I went in and saw that the, it came back into market. Uh, so uh, I, I reached out to my realtor and she she told me that uh, it uh, the, the previous offer basically fell through due to the financing issue. So uh, by putting 25,000 down in there, right? It basically, first it showed that we don't have any issues with the financing. And second thing, uh, which I also did was, uh, I did reach out to my mortgage broker and my mortgage broker provided me a letter saying that this person qualifies, like he's already pre-approved for this much amount. And we also added that thing, attached that letter with our purchase contract, right? So now the seller knows that uh, I have, uh, I have financial backing to purchase this property, right? So again, when you have multiple offer situation, uh, and and so when you support all these additional stuff, right? Higher deposit, uh, letter like letter of support of financial document, those things definitely help you in that process. Yeah, that definitely strengthens your 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 offer, offer. there for the yes, buyer. Yes, I I, uh, I I also like when uh, we were closing on this property. Uh, my realtor told me that there were two backup offers uh, on that property at that point of time. So if I fell through, there were two other people had a backup offer on the property, right? So I didn't definitely didn't want to lose the on it uh, because it was a yeah. great property. Uh, but right, I, I I tried to negotiate as much as I can on that. Yes, yes. Okay, all great tips there. So so next, once we buy the property, comes the rehab portion. 
How yes. did you go about estimating the re the repair cost or the rehab cost uh, before putting in your offer? Uh, so uh, when when I put my offer in uh, and uh, we, we get certain amount of days to close, what I started doing is uh, I I had pictures of because what I was doing with this uh, property is putting a legal basement in there, right? So I uh, when 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 I was uh, viewing the property with my real at that point of time. I took some pictures and videos of the basement, right? And then uh, what I did is uh, I started reaching out to different contractors. So I have uh, you know, other like I have a network of other investors um, who have gone through the same process. So I reached out to their contractors. I also reached out to contractors uh, which are uh, uh, which are doing this for a long time, right? So they are advertising on social media through the websites, and I was basically sending them pictures uh, and videos of what I've taken. And asking them, this is what I'm looking for, right? Two bedroom, kitchen, uh, bathroom, uh, second furnace to make a to make a legal basement, right? Uh, can you please give me a quote? So I started receiving quotes from them, uh, uh, and there were uh, there were some low ballers, and there was uh, people were asking too much money, right? But most of the time, uh, when you started getting numbers uh, nearer to each other, that's when you know that approximately this is how much it's gonna cost you. So. Uh, so when I was putting the offer at that point of time, I knew that approximately my budget is gonna be like this, right? It's gonna definitely there is a plus or five, uh, plus or minuses in there, but uh, roughly yeah. I had an idea how much it's gonna cost me for the for the renovation part. Okay, and were you only looking to renovate the the basement? Did you do anything to the the main floor? Um, so when I started to doing my MLS search uh, at that point of time, what I was uh, preferring for the uh, for the bulk part of it. Uh, because uh, I was looking for something where the main floor was pretty much rent ready. So with this one, uh, it, it was, right? I'll, I'll discuss about this thing in the, the renting part of it, but uh, that was my main criteria. So for the upstairs, I, I just had to do few cosmetic stuff, uh, right? Where, but mainly, uh, I would say 98% of the work was just focus on the basement. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um. Uh. A common problem that newer investors have is over renovating. How did you ensure that you don't fall into this trap? Now, I know setting up a basement suite is pretty much standard, making it rent ready, but um, were there any like specific things that you were looking for just to keep yourself in check that you're not over renovating? So whenever I'm uh, doing any kind of renovation, the first thing that I always think of uh, I also talk to my wife, <laughs> first of all, but <laughs> I also take uh, a lot of input from her uh, because yeah. uh, definitely two minds uh, work, work much better than just having one mind, right? So uh, whenever I uh, look into renovating any rental properties, I first thing that comes to my mind is I am not living there. It's going to be tenants. If I live there, I'm going to maintain the property. If there are tenants, they will not take care of the property the way you would, right? Um, yeah, the se uh, second thing that I would I would do is keep the tenant profile in your mind, right? So when, when you're buying a property, you definitely do research in your neighborhood, right? What kind of neighborhood is that? Uh, what kind of tenant profiles are you gonna get into that? And do your uh, uh, do your uh, renovations according to that, right? Uh, you will definitely be uh, tempted to put the higher, like the most expensive kitchen and all those kind of stuff. But uh, what what's your return of investment on that one, right? So return of investment is something that I always uh, look for. Uh, so when I was uh, when I was deciding upon what I wanted to do with this property, um, two things uh, that was in my mind. Uh, when it comes to bedroom, for example, bedroom is nothing than four walls with a closet and a light in there with electric plus. Nothing. You cannot do anything more into those bedrooms, right? Uh, same thing with your living area. Uh, there are only two places that I personally think uh, gives you the most value. First is the kitchen and second is your washrooms, right? So if you go, th if you make your renovations where you put most of your effort, effort to have a, a nice looking kitchen and nice looking washroom, you will get the best return of investment on that. So so when I was renovating basements, uh, so those things, kitchen, bathroom was my uh, 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 main uh, focus. Another focus uh, that I was looking at is which already has a side entrance, right? So I don't have to cut the side entrance. I don't have to cut the concrete. And then uh, one thing also I was looking. So with this basement, what I had to do is, and I think most of the basements, uh, 
uh, most of the bungalows, unless and until those are bi level bungalows, but most of the regular uh, bungalows, they don't have uh, windows well, big enough. Uh, so if there is any fire or something, uh, it, if they are not big enough for you to escape in, right? So city requests you to have those windows, egress windows. So when I was cutting windows, uh, I made sure that I make windows bigger than just the minimum uh, requirement. And that's what I found. So when, when I was uh, putting ads on uh, Facebook, Kijiji and all those things for the renting, very first thing few people were noticing is those kitchen and big windows, right? Because uh, they didn't feel like they are living in the basement. So window was uh, uh, a big, uh, big thing. Uh, storage. If you're living in the basement, storage is one of the big concerns for tenants, right? So uh, making sure that they have enough amount of storage to store some of their additional stuff is definitely something to uh, that I also focused on. Yeah, th those are definitely great points. I was actually going to just, I was just about to ask you about the windows um, mm -hmm. um, because it's, I think it's definitely uh, an added benefit when you have bigger windows as opposed to just the minimum size that you need in a basement to have those egress windows. Yes. Um, it, it increases the, the wow factor for sure. Exactly. Um, and I think it will just also increase your, um, you know, your decrease your vacancy rates and increase your, your tenant yes. retention, right? Yes. Because you don't feel like you're living in a basement, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because the, there'll be 10 other people who are renting out the basement, right? How are you making your basement uh, uh, look yeah. uh, like, uh, making sure that they look different than other people, right? Why would people rent your basement versus renting someone else's basement? So, yes, yes. Yeah. Well, were, were there any things that you had to keep yourself in check with with regards to um, the kitchen and, and the bathroom, not going for, you know, flip quality stuff versus like rent, rent quality stuff? Were there any... Any circumstances there? Uh, so uh, with the kitchen, uh, most of the quotes that I was getting for, uh, for one thing that, okay, so yes, you have to look into, uh, like you have to make sure that uh, you renovate according to your tenant profile, but you also have to think that uh, when you're going to go for refinancing, you have to have uh, a better quality. So for example, yeah. um, when I was uh, doing this renovation, uh, I wanted to make sure that the kitchen is uh, looking pretty nice. One for the renting purpose and second for the appraising pur appraisal purpose. So when I went for the kitchen renovation, uh, I made sure that I had a quartz countertop rather than going for those, uh, uh, the vinyl uh, countertops, right? Uh, it definitely costed me a little bit more, but then I cut that cost somewhere else, right? So I didn't go for very expensive flooring, so to speak. I didn't go for those black uh, handle accessories or uh, hardware accessories, right? I just went for plain, sim like uh, what you call silver accessories, which are pretty common nowadays. So, uh, so yeah, you if you're doing flips, then you would go for something like that. Uh, another thing that uh, I did is I didn't go for stainless steel appliances. I just went with regular white uh, appliances because uh, <laughs> it's going to be with tenants. So but there will be scratches, right? So you don't want to feel uh, feel and a lot of pain by looking at those scratches. So, yeah, so those are the things uh, with, even with the washrooms and everything, uh, we went, like we went with uh, good quality stuff, right? But we didn't uh, break a, uh, a buck by just, just in order to get, uh, get to, get to those kind of renovations. Yes. Cause I think that's, that's something that, that you always have to keep in mind is, uh, the amount of money that I'm spending on the renovation, am, is this going to increase my after repair value um, nice. by the same amount or, or hopefully more um, so that you are able to pull your money back out, you know, or as much of it as you possibly can. That is um, correct. So, yeah, those are those are great tips. Yeah. And and that's a, the, the, those are the things, right? So, for example, whenever we go for an appraiser, uh, what we have been, uh, what I've been learning is uh, things that, that provides you good appraising, uh, appraisal sales, your kitchen, bathroom, and then windows, right? Uh, the appraiser is not going to give you uh, well, more appraised value if you have uh, $2.50 final plank versus $6 final plank, right? That's definitely not yeah. getting you more money. So uh, it's at the end of the day, it's, it's it has to be intentional renovations uh, to get that course appreciation at the end of the day. Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any, I mean, you gave us a lot, but just in case we missed anything, do you have any other tips with regards to adding a basement suite? Um, you know, any construction tips or any anything around around developing a basement there? 
so first of all, uh, uh, where I work, uh, mostly city of Edmonton, they have a good resource on their website, which basically shows them uh, that in order to make a legal basement suite, these are the criteria that you have to follow, right? So spend a good amount of time, uh, go through those documentation. So when I, like, when I was purchasing the property, I had that document uh, on my desk. So whenever I was looking property, I was checking boxes, right? If any of the boxes doesn't meet, I would basically stop looking at that property, right? So go through city of Edmonton website, look at what are the criteria to uh, make a legal basement suite, uh, uh, interview your contractors, right? Uh, because sometimes the uh, contractors will, uh, give you low ball offers, but they don't know actually what they are uh, talking about. Right. So have those, that checklist and ask those questions to your contractor, right? What are your width requirements? What are the height requirements? Uh, those kind of stuff. So, right. So when, well, for, for my criteria for this, uh, when, uh, when I was building this basement is I wanted to have at least two bedrooms. I was getting cheaper deals, um, in some of those houses, but the space, the way it was structured, I was uh, able to get only one bedroom in there. And just by doing one bedroom, all you're doing is basically, uh, I, I believe you are uh, losing 50 or 60% of the population who are interested in renting the basement, right? So just by having two bedrooms, I was able to increase the scope of, uh, uh, scope like uh, increase the, the pool of tenants, so to speak. And uh, yeah, so my criteria was pretty straightforward, two bedroom, kitchen, bathroom, and uh, living area with lots of storage. Uh, and then, uh, I, I was thinking of having always having a common area so that uh, when I want to go into uh, changing filters and do any kind of maintenance, I will have to go through serving notices to my uh, tenants in there, right? So I didn't want to disturb their uh, life. So I just, uh, that's why I wanted to have that common area. Uh, so those were a few requirements that I had at that point of time. And again, uh, every property is different. Every property structure is different, right? Some uh, properties will allow you two bedrooms. Uh, I, I know some people who have three bedrooms in the basement. Some will have two bedrooms and you know, one and a half bathroom, right? So it all depends on the uh, the type of property that you're working with. Yeah. Yeah. Tell yeah. me, uh, what yeah. what's the square footage on this one? Uh, so uh, the upstairs is 1100 and the basement, after they remove stairs and everything, somewhere around 1000 square footage. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the common area... Um, so does it work like uh, it's downstairs and then it's sort of once you go into the common area, then there's the entrance for the basement suite? Yes. So uh, so what we did is uh, when I was uh, uh, when I was renovating, I wanted to one criteria that I, I also had, which I, I think I forgot to mention when I was uh, renovating, I wanted to make sure that the tenant upstairs uh, and downstairs, they are not sharing the laundry uh, that definitely. Uh, uh, due to hygiene purpose, right? Uh, people do not yeah. prefer and that there are some other reasons, right? Uh, because uh, uh, you never know, like if your tenant don't, tenants don't go along, uh, they want to do laundry at the same time and then they are fighting, right? It just creates unnecessary uh, uh, ruckus, right? And you, you, you want to focus on your investing journey rather than managing your tenants, right? So one of my uh, uh, requirement was to have separate set of laundry. So what happened is, uh, I was told, like my, many contractors told me that put a laundry upstairs, but the way upstairs was structured, I was not able to leverage any of those spaces to put another, put, put a separate laundry. Uh, and if I was doing it, what I was doing is I was either uh, eliminating an entire bedroom altogether, or I was eating up a lot of closet space, right? So that was doing few things. It was removing a uh, closet space and it was definitely increasing my cost, right? So what I did is, I kept the laundry in the basement for the upstairs tenant and for the basement tenants, they have their own laundry within their own basement unit, right? So that common area that I left there so that uh, the tenants who are living upstairs, they can use that common area to go into the mechanical room and use laundry without uh, having to share laundry, right? So that common area is basically, right? So you come downstairs, there's a common space. You use that common space to go into the mechanical room, right? So, um, Whenever I want to go in there to inspect anything, uh, if I want to change for nest filters, I don't have to worry about giving notices to my tenants for that. That is that is pretty convenient and very future thinking for when you actually have to manage the property. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. And and adding um, the 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 washer and dryer downstairs, mm -hmm. did that the way the way it was structured that didn't take away from um, the square footage that you needed for the basement suite, huh? No, not not at all. So uh, with the uh, 
if the way we have structured so so the basement where uh, the way i have made the basement all the plumbing that uh, that was supposed to happen we i did the plumbing where my existing plumbing was there right so i didn't have to dig a lot of uh, like i didn't have to dig a lot of concrete uh, in the basement you definitely have to do uh, uh, some right but it wasn't uh, too much and then uh, the laundry space the way we structure our laundry space is uh, we use the gloss like let's say if we didn't have this laundry uh, in the basement we would have uh, i don't know maybe 15 feet uh, wide closet right 15 feet wide closet you don't even get in your own houses right so uh, so what we did is we basically uh, uh, made that closet space a little smaller but it was still around uh, 11 and a half feet of closet space for the bedroom and the another part of the closet space i use the laundry so um, let's say and it, it has a door in there so let's say for example if you are uh, sitting in the living area and if you're looking at the bedroom uh, you wouldn't even know that there is a laundry right so it was pretty uh, the flow of it is, uh, uh, it doesn't look like that there was anything forced into that space. Great, great. And mm -hmm. did you go about actually designing the layout? Did you did you outsource that to someone else? I did uh, 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 brainstorming with many people, right? Many contractors. Every contractor had their own thoughts, right? So picking uh, thoughts or ideas from uh, different people, right? And then uh, what I used to do is... Uh, uh, like I used to listen uh, to the contractors, right? What what they had to say about that, and eventually uh, also asking you know, that is it possible if you want to do this, right? So uh, I definitely was giving them their own creative space to uh, tell me what they can do with this property because they have done so many renovations in the past, right? So uh, why not leverage uh, their experiences and uh, if if that experience uh, ties ties with what you're trying to achieve, um, may as well just use it. So. Uh, with this one, uh, the idea of the laundry, because uh, uh, when I was I, the way I was planning the laundry, it was definitely not make sense. And this the contractor who did this job, he said that I have done something like this in my uh, another job that he had done in the past. So it's like, yeah, it that it makes sense. Let's just go through it, right? So it it literally took me. He uh, proposed the idea within two minutes. We had our final plan design. Great, and that just shows you, like you say, the importance of putting a team together because you don't need to know everything. You can leverage their knowledge and their experience and their expertise exactly. in that specific field, right? So exactly. it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. 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 Um yeah. Were, were there any issues with the specific process with the the, the the rehab? Um and if so, how are you able to overcome them? Whether that's rehabbing the property itself, um managing contractors, delays in getting the the rehab done, anything along those lines? Oh, <laughs> that's a, that, that's a big topic there. And yes, there were, uh, I wouldn't say a delay as to speak. So that, that definitely was some delays due to the, uh, due to the, uh, what you call trade shortages, so to speak, because, uh, there are so many houses getting built, right? So many properties or real estate transactions that were happening, trades were busy pretty much. Right, so you have to, to make a lot of calls to make sure that everything was on time. On top of uh, uh, delays from the trade, there were delays from city as well because uh, uh, summer time. First of all, there were a lot of real estate transactions happening, and then a lot of people are buying houses. But other than that, many other homeowners were also doing the renovations. Right, so they are putting a deck in the backyard or putting a, a hot tub or something. Right, so the the city also has to go through all those uh, permitting process. So permit. Uh, um, it took us two months to get our uh, building permit, uh, right? So there are two stages for the uh, secondary suite. Uh, one is the uh, uh, development permit. Another one is the building permit. Usually development permit is pretty fast. Uh, if you don't have to make any structural changes to your house or to your uh, property. Uh, in my case, because we were uh, cutting a fresh window in the concrete, city wanted to make sure that uh, after we cut the concrete, the structure was still... Uh, sound right so what they wanted us to do to make sure that you have uh, uh, you have a report from an engineer saying that uh, okay you are cutting video uh, windows here how big the windows are going to be and after cutting the window is the foundation of the house is going to be uh, compromised in any sense right and then the city has to go through all those documents make sure everything is aligned right so so development permit uh, took around a month and then uh, building permit took the same so it took us two months to get those permits uh, and then when I uh, look in the back, 
I look 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 into past. Uh, I think our construction just took us two months, two two okay. months plus little bit, right? So so yeah, so trade trade delays definitely uh, because they had a lot of uh, work in their platter at that point of time. I can guarantee you that it uh, <laughs> right now. If I have to do this process again, it might be much much faster because uh, not many people are buying. Uh, uh, not many homeowners are or or so want to be homeowners are buying houses at this point of time. Investors are still doing it uh, because yeah. they know how the real estate cycle works, right? So, yeah. So trade delays, uh, delays from the city. Uh, uh, at this point of time, we didn't have any issues with the supply uh, uh, supply chain because uh, uh, we were hitting at the like we were hitting the end of the COVID uh, timeline. So all the uh, all the big ticket items such as our furnaces, uh, hot water tank. And then uh, flooring, kitchen cabinets, they were all pretty much readily available. Uh, so yeah, uh, one thing if I have to give advice, uh, you have to make sure that you keep your tap on your contract all the time, right? So uh, with this one, I was uh, I was pretty much there uh, every day or every second day uh, visiting my property, making sure because what happens is when when the trade work there. Uh, don't think that they know everything that they're doing, right? Or because they would uh, try to ignore so many things. So unless and until you visit your property, uh, go through the whole process of uh, the renovation, if they are making any mistakes, uh, which they definitely will. So you have to make sure that you catch those mistakes initially. Tell your contractor, these are the mistakes that you have been doing so far. Please correct them, right? Before it's too late. So while the renovation is going or rehab is going, you have to make sure that you are present uh, uh, on your property every day or two or maybe at least twice or thrice a week to uh, pay attention to what's going on there. And how were you looking for these mistakes? Were you just um, looking for what the city requires for uh, a legal basement suite and seeing if, if they're on par with that? Or um, like for someone that has no constru- oh, no, no, no experience with, uh, with regards to actually um, you know, putting a basement suite together? So, uh, yeah, so uh, those checklists that I have with City, right? Uh, second uh, source that I was using is my contractor's own drawing. So if uh, my contractor said that, okay, this closet is going to be, or the laundry closet is going to be this size, or kitchen, if your washroom is going to, we're going to be five by eight, right? I was, I had, uh, I had to measure tape on my hand every time, right? So whenever they were putting any framing or any structures, I was measuring everything. And uh, we did have to like uh, so same thing with the laundry uh, space. So whatever laundry space that uh, that was there in their uh, drawing, it was little sh- like two or three inches shorter than that. So I was like, okay, this is not according to your planning. They had and then they basically went and make made, make it bigger. Because if they hadn't done it that point of time, uh, your renovation is now completed. You bring your laundry units in there, and now your laundry units doesn't fit in there, right? Doesn't so fit. those yeah. things. Same thing with the bathroom walls. Uh, when they were uh, doing a plumbing for a bathroom, right? There, there are certain distances that, or certain, there are certain code requirements for plumbing that you have to meet. So you read those code requirements, right? It's just, just Googling everything online. Uh, it's pretty much available, right? And then if something is not matching the uh, required code, you let your contractor know that you are not meeting this requirement, please go ahead and fix it, right? So they do definitely fix it. And then, uh, uh, there are other uh, investors who were doing the same process while I was doing it, right? So I was uh, following, uh, uh, like I was reaching out to them saying that, hey, uh, this is what I have found so far, right? Do you think this is correct, right? So if they know something, they were able to share their knowledge with me, similar like vice versa, right? So yeah, yes. so uh, yes, so some, uh, like mostly those documentations and their drawings, those are the resources that I was using, uh, knowledge from other investors. Uh, and sometimes, uh, right, un- un- unless and until you go there, you don't know what's going to go, what's going to happen. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. So definitely be hands on um, yes. during this process. Make sure you you are there and you're just checking yeah. the boxes, making sure yeah. everything's running smoothly. Yeah. Don't don't shy away from asking questions, right? Because uh, un- unless you uh, unless and until you ask them, you're not going to get answers to them, right? So you have to ask yeah. for ask for ask questions. And then um, I was like, I was, I was in constant touch with my contractor as well. Uh, uh, I know that uh, I'm kind of, you could say I'm kind of control free, uh, right? So I, I want to know what's going in with my, with yes. my property because it's, 
it's no cheap money, right? If uh, you have yeah. invested uh, so much money, you want to make sure that the investment that you are doing is uh, use is getting used properly, right? So I was uh, asking my contractor questions all over the time, and he was uh, uh, yes, definitely there were delays, but he was uh, gracious enough that he was not uh, what you call awarding awarding me, right? Yes. So he was answering yes. my questions, so responding to my messages. We did fight <laughs> on messages on from over the phone, but it's it's a part of the process. Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. All good tips there, really good tips. Mm -hmm. Um, so once that's done, the next portion we have is the rent portion of the strategy. Mm -hmm. Um, if we can dive into that, so have you got tenants into this property as yet? And if so, how long did it take you to get the property occupied once it was rent ready? So, uh. So uh, I'm, as I mentioned earlier, uh, when I was buying this property, I, what I was looking for is the main floor is pretty much rent ready, right? So what I did is, so on the main floor, the only renovation that I had to do was uh, I had to just replace tiles in the kitchen and washroom. The reason behind that was uh, the tiling that was there previously, whoever did that renovations, I don't know how many years ago, the tiling was, the tiles were breaking, right? So it okay. didn't have proper base in there. Uh, and my worry at that point of time is uh, like uh, I was getting a recommendation. Why are you making like why are you spending money uh, on this thing? But I was like, yeah, if if those tile break and then my tenants are living there and now if I have to bring bring contractors, right? It's too much of a work, too much of a headache, right? So and it wasn't costing me too much because I incorporated the whole uh, like upstairs renovations with downstairs renovations, so it was not okay. costing me a lot of money. So. On the main floor, all I did was just uh, replacing tiles on the kitchen and bathroom and just added an exhaust uh, going out, uh, a, a kitchen exhaust, which is going out. There was already kitchen exhaust, but it was not venting out. So I just added a vent. That was pretty much all the renovation, which took me three days, right? So I, uh, the day I occupied the property, uh, we got the renovation done. And uh, within 15 days of occupying the property, I had tenants secured for the main floor. So Great. from wow. yes, so from first few like within fifteen days, I had uh, tenant who are living upstairs and paying the rent. So far, they have been uh, always on time uh, paying rent. Right, touch wood, <laughs> knock on the wood. <laughs> uh, one thing that I had to do with those tenants, I had to give them a certain amount of discount each month. Uh, I, I basically gave them hundred dollars discount, right? Uh, because I knew that there will be construction happening in the basement. There will be a lot of noise happening and it will create a lot of disturbance for tenants upstairs. So uh, there were different recommendations I had at that point of time that uh, uh, charge them a rent, like a uh, full rent that you, you, you would usually charge and just say that uh, the last month I'll give you for free kind of stuff, right? But what happens is when the renovation is going in the basement and if the tenants are not seeing any kind of... Uh, reimbursement for any of those disturbances, right? The, they would start complaining to you, right? So what I did to, uh, do that is I gave them a discount on the monthly rent saying that, and, and I mentioned this thing in the contract as well, that uh, this rent reflects uh, uh, reflects a discount because of any inconvenience that happens during the construction in the basement, right? So uh, uh, they, they were getting discount, right? And that's why they didn't complain during the whole construction uh, that we did for four five months there. That's a great strategy, actually. Um, yeah. So, so, so essentially, how it works is you give them a hundred dollar discount for each month that mm -hmm. the construction is going on for, and then once it's complete, it goes back to back yeah. to full price. Yes, not not. So what I did is I basically give them that hundred dollar discount for the whole year, right? It's still twelve hundred. Oh, I see. Okay. It's still twelve hundred bucks discount, uh, whereas uh, if I had waited for the Whole, const whole construction to finish for four or five months, it would have costed me, uh, I don't know, six, seven thousand dollars, right? So, twelve hundred versus six, seven thousand, absolutely, 000, right? So, yes, yeah, so those the I did that kind of calculation. And even let's see if I went ahead with the uh, with one month discount at the end of the term, uh, this twelve hundred is definitely much cheaper than even that one month discount, right? So, uh, by doing this, uh, I, I had to give them a lesser discount. But uh, they were seeing uh, the value of uh, uh, the discount that I was providing them on a monthly basis. Yes, no, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, that's a smart strategy, getting people in there as soon mm -hmm. as possible. I know for insurance purposes as well, 
uh it's it's another benefit because it's not yes. a vacant property now which yes. is a much more expensive premium and yes. less coverages so um i think it's a win on all ends yeah that's good point that you brought because uh, when i was uh, started uh, looking into the insurance policies what happened is uh, i got possession on uh, of my policy and at that point of time i definitely didn't have any uh, tenants in there so my primary insurance who insures uh, my house they were saying that well there are no tenants so uh, uh, we do have to give you a, a more, much more expensive uh, contract right and uh, sorry much more expensive insurance policy uh, so and, and then they said and they had different conditions so that even with this policy if there is any fire or water damage we would not cover it right so due to those reasons i had to go with another insurance the uh, provider which was char charging me uh, uh, a very expensive right i was paying around uh, 210 some dollars so uh, each one uh, but as soon as i got this tenants in i reached out to my uh, main insurance company and then basically they happily added me there so every month yes by giving 100 dollars discount to my tenant upstairs I was basically getting hundred dollars discount on my insurance policy, right? So it was a trade off at the end of the day, and uh, yeah, so so uh, those that that's what happened with the insurance policy, and uh, and in that case, what happens is they will now cover if there is any fire or if there is any water, insurance policy would cover those uh, damage if if it occurs. Exactly, exactly. So it was a win all around. Yeah. So it was for the main floor tenant. So yes, I had that main floor tenants from. Uh, uh, 15 days uh, with, within 15 days since I uh, bought this property and for the basement tenants uh, well, yeah uh, I had secured the basement tenant uh, even before I got the final uh, approval from the uh, from the city right so pretty much everything was done uh, on my property so uh, what I did is I just listed the property and uh, uh, there were a lot of inquiries uh, about it right and then again you have to go through all the uh, your due diligence what are the what what type of tenants that you're looking for kind of stuff and then uh, yeah so what i did is uh, i had uh, i had very nice uh, profile tenants uh, who were interested in the basement so i secured them but i just put one condition or, or kind of an addendum in the contract that uh, i'm still awaiting the inspect final inspection from the city uh, if it passes uh, before this date then we will uh, continue with our uh, rental agreement at that point of time and if not then uh, uh, I have right to renegotiate uh, the, the the final possession date, right? Uh, and by God's grace, uh, I was able to uh, get my final inspection passed uh, before they taking the possession, so I didn't have to renegotiate my uh, the the new possession date, right? So I had secured tenants before even I get got my inspection. In there. That's great because um you know tenants might be thinking hey i need to be out of my previous place by the end of this month so i need to know that I've, i'm going to be able to move in here you know or <laughs> find another place so it's good that you were able to uh get that all sorted before that and and one thing that i have noticed with uh, with so there are two type of tenants you would always find uh some um some particular situations aside there are two type of tenants that i've seen some tenants uh, who do not pay attention to how, who do not pay attention to your rental property. They don't maintain properties and everything. And I've seen most of those tenants are, uh, they are basically looking at houses two days before they have to vacate, vacate the property, right? So when I was looking at my, so these tenants that I had, so they took possession uh, 15th September. Their lease was ending September end. So they started looking uh, uh, end of August. Right, so I know that they have started looking at a rental property one month in advance. It means that they know that what's going on with the rental property when the term is ending, right? So they were they were insisting to stretch uh, their possession uh, till the end of September, right? Uh, and I was saying that no, I I, I want someone in September first, even though I didn't have inspection. So I told that like okay. let's meet in the middle, right? So we both met in the middle. So like according to their lease agreement. They were about to, uh, uh, what you call, vacate their previous house end of September, but uh, uh, I was able to secure them as a tenant 15 days before, right? Because I, I, I definitely didn't want to lose any money for those 15 days that, that the property will be empty. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, you brought up some great points there. Well, firstly, for them, I mean, it's it's great because they get to move over 15 days, make sure yeah. they leave in their previous place um, <laughs> in a good condition so they, you know, yeah. they can 
get get the deposit back there. But yes. um, you know, with regards to choosing tenants that look for a new place way mm-hmm. in advance, you know, mm-hmm. they organized. Um, yes. you know, they 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 plan ahead. It's not like they um they're not able to cover the current rent and now they're trying to run to find a new place. They mm-hmm. they they're more yeah. likely to be reliable tenants. Um, mm-hmm. That being said, though, like what tenant profile were you looking for for this property? What what were you looking for to rent out the main floor and the basement seat? What what qualities? So with the with the uh, secondary suite, so what it's basically a single uh, detached house, right? Where you have tenant upstairs, tenant downstairs. So I was uh, my tenant profile was uh, clear. I didn't want more than uh, uh, three people in any right. So. Because uh, uh, if you have more people, it's definitely going to create a lot of noise and then essentially conflict. So uh, the tenant profile that I was looking for is maybe a, a couple with a, a couple with a small kid, right? Uh, but not uh, a couple with three kids uh, living in the basement, right? So uh, when I was looking at it, I didn't want to go more than... Uh, so if I have three bedroom upstairs, I didn't want to have more than three people, right? Similarly, in the basement, if I have... Uh, two bedrooms i didn't want to have more than two people uh, right well let's say if it's a couple with a small kid in the basement that's that's okay but i didn't want to have three adults living in the basement where there are only two bedrooms there so uh, and in terms of tenant profile just a regular uh, uh, full-time uh, working uh, working people and yeah uh, obviously you have to make sure that you do your background check you do your due diligence uh, uh, Getting back to the older the the, the point that I mentioned previously that uh, I definitely didn't want to lose money by leaving the M property weekend for 15 days. There is a caveat in that statement though. I know that you want to have uh, your property occupied as soon as possible, but you have to make sure that you do your diligence in picking your tenants because yeah. if you pick bad tenants. Uh, just because you didn't want to uh, leave the property empty for 15 days or 30 days it's going to cost you a lot at the end of the day, right? You have to make sure that you do your due diligence in picking up the right kind of tenant that suits your, uh, your uh, what you call your investing, right? So Yes, great tip. Uh, you, you, don't, you don't just want to rush into picking the first tenant just so that you sure. can cover the expenses, right? Uh, exactly. Um, you definitely don't want to make decisions out of a scarcity mindset, but that is correct. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's correct. Um, and for this, I, I, are you going to be self-managing the property or are you going to be outsourcing this? Yes, I'll be self-managing this property, right? Okay. Uh, I have I have my uh, I have my uh, set criteria, so, uh, so, right? So I, I want to experience uh, dealing with tenants because uh, even though you hire property managers, at the end of the day, for many things, you are, if you hire a property manager, you are managing property managers and they are definitely smarter than tenants. So, yeah, I didn't want to manage any uh, property manager and I didn't want to uh, spend uh, a certain amount of money every month going to property managers uh, without doing a lot of hard work, right? That's that's the reason I decided to go with the self-managing of this property. Um, in future, though, uh, right, uh, depending upon uh, where I take my business, uh, I might decide to go ahead and uh, do property manager on this one, right? So I'm I, I'm not uh, stiff in terms of my decision going with property manager or without it. Absolutely, yeah, that makes sense. Actually, just going back to what you previously said with your tenant profile, I know you mm-hmm. said you were, you know, looking for perhaps, you know, a couple with a younger kid. Was mm-hmm. that a decision that you um, factored in when it came to uh, developing the basement? Um, like, for example, um, making sure you put in a bathtub and, and not just a shower because mm-hmm. if people have kids, they need a bathtub, where some mm-hmm. basement sh- suites maybe just have a shower instead mm-hmm. of a bathtub. Was that something you considered? So I did actually, I did put uh, just a shower. I didn't put a bathtub in the basement for this one. Oh, you did? Yes, okay. I did. Okay. Yeah, I didn't put, I didn't put that one. And, uh, and, and that's the reason, because what I wanted is, because I have a family living up there, so husband, wife, and, and a kid. Right, I didn't want to have uh, another kid in the basement, so that that was that was not an intentional uh, decision at that point of time because I was also looking at the the space that was available for me to make a basement. But by doing so, right, many people who had kids, right, uh, they definitely prefer a, a, a bathroom with the with the tub, right. In this case, because it didn't have it, I had basically I have I have a tenant who do not have kids right now, right. So. Yes. Uh, 
if there are kids up there, kid downstairs, uh, I don't know what would happen. Like, and you know that actually makes a lot of sense because especially having kids downstairs, because the downstairs tenants tend to hear all the walking above them. Mm-hmm. Um, and now you have a sleeping kid and then you have downstairs tenants complaining that the kids yeah. been woken by the people mm-hmm. upstairs. So yeah, yeah, yeah. if you're going to have kids, probably want to have them upstairs as opposed upstairs. to having them downstairs. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Or, why, yeah. or vice versa is also fine because the kids definitely want to run, right? And if they run upstairs, it's yeah. a lot of noise downstairs. But again, with yeah. the with the legal secondary requirement that you have, right, there are a lot of uh, uh, sound barrier, fire protection, as well as resilient channel that you have to do between both streets. That will definitely dampen a lot of noise. You will still hear noise, right? If you are walking yeah. on it, you'll still hear it, but it's going to dampen it uh, a lot more than just the regular bass line. Yes, definitely. Yes. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Okay. And the final stage is the the cash out refinance. Yes. Um, have you gotten uh, an appraisal on, on this property? Or if not, not yet. what are you expecting it to appraise at? Uh, not yet. I have, I, I'm still in the process of appraising it. Uh, my, okay. I am, I have, I have reached out to my mortgage broker. He is currently on vacation. So I'm just waiting for him to come back so that I can uh, proceed with the refinancing. Uh, for the refinancing, I've already reached out to my realtor, right? And we were able to get some comps in that area, right? So, so people who don't know comps is, uh, it's basically a similar property sold within, within or nearer to that area, right? So I was able to get few comps uh, with the same criteria, three bedroom upstairs, two bedroom downstairs, uh, a single family bungalow with two garage, two car garage. Uh, the comps that I was seeing uh, is pretty much in the range around $450,000. Okay. Yeah. And is that so what have, you were, have, were expecting? Uh, I was expecting a little bit more around 460, 470. But again, when I bought the prop, the reason why I was expecting that much, uh, because uh, I know uh, one of my friends, in that area who did the same thing and he got his refinance value at 470 with the pretty much similar type of property having said that the time has changed since then at that point of time the real estate market was pretty uh it, it was booming at that point of time right so the time has definitely changed so it's definitely lower than what i was uh, what i was expecting but it is still uh something where uh, i am able like i would be able to rinse and repeat the whole process okay okay yeah. so yeah um, so you are expecting to essentially get most or all of all of the money that you put in back? Yes, yes. So I would be basically, uh, I my initial investment in this property was around uh, seventy-seven thousand uh, dollars, and I would be, I should be able to pull out, I should be able to pull out everything and leaving around twelve to thirteen thousand dollars in the day. That's not bad. That's yeah, yeah. not bad at all. Um, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll ask you just a little more on the numbers in a second, though. But yeah, yeah. Um, what sort of interest rate are, are you expecting to to get once you refinance? I'm uh, I'm I'm a stiff believer going with variable rates, right? Uh, because with my primary residence, I went with the uh, fixed rate. Uh, looking back at the history, right? Uh, what I've seen is variable rate. Even though variable rate, uh, sorry. The fixed rate gives you that comfort that uh, this is going to be our monthly rent, uh, rate at this point of time, All right? So if you lock in at around 2% or 3%, yeah, it'll, it gives you the uh, what you call the comfort for whatever term that you lock in for. But uh, previously, the history shows that uh, eventually in the long term, variable rate wins. So I am going to stick with the variable rate even with this one because I know that uh, interest rates are uh, going up. But uh, I definitely see them uh, coming down eventually, right? So I'm going to ride ride out on this one because at this point of time, uh, there is not a lot of difference between, even if I want to go with fixed rate, there is not a lot of difference, right? So most of the interest rate that I'm seeing is variable minus 0.5. That, that's what I'm seeing right now. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so, you know, we've, we've all heard the saying, you know, know your numbers. Yes. Um, would you mind just running us through like a quick summary of what the numbers are. You told us how much you put in, mm-hmm. um, you know, just the total cost that you incurred during the process, mm-hmm. um, the monthly income, and then the expenses on your monthly expenses on, on the deal. So uh, let me run before uh, refinancing and after refinancing. So I uh, I bought this property for $307,000 uh, and the renovation for the putting a legal basement and renovating upstairs costed me around $63,000. So all in all, the initial investment was $370,000. Uh, 
uh, I'm just going to look at my, because I wrote these numbers down. Uh, so I put 20% down out of it, which is around $74,000 and the closing cost was 3000 So all in all, I had my initial investment as $77,000. The remaining was financed by the bank. Uh, so in terms of the rem uh, in terms of the revenue, I'm getting from both upper and down unit, I'm getting $3,000 a month. Uh, now that is with the low, uh, with the discounted uh, rate that I'm charging tenants who are upstairs. I'm planning to increase the uh, rent next year at least by $150. That's that's what my plan is. Uh, depending upon if if the interest rate keeps rising, uh, everything is going to be expensive. And with the market, you have to increase your rents as well. So currently, the revenue of the property, so the rent from up, upstairs and downstairs is coming around $3,000. And in terms of the expenses, uh, so the when when I talk about expenses, things that I'm calculating in there is uh, my mortgage, uh, my uh, insurance, property taxes, uh, utility fees, and then I'm also putting five percent uh, uh, of my total rent towards the vacancy and uh, towards the uh, maintenance. So if there is any maintenance issue happens, so uh, uh, all in all, after that, my expenses are coming around twenty four ninety. So with the with the ex revenue minus expenses, uh, the monthly cash flow that I'm seeing on this one is five hundred and eighty dollars. Yeah, yeah. So okay. that's uh, that's before financing. Uh, if I decide to refinance uh, and and let's say uh, if I'm getting that four hundred and fifty thousand dollars value, uh, so three or four hundred and fifty is refinance at eighty percent loan to value is around three hundred and sixty k, and out of that three sixty k, my Initial mortgage is 296k. So new mortgage is 360 minus initial mortgage is 296. So the difference is 64,000k. Uh, so what will happen is uh, in my initial investment was $77,000, and uh, with the refinancing, I'll get back $64,000, which will leave $13,000 in in the property in the, deal. In the yeah. deal. And uh, uh, what would that would do though? That, that will definitely decrease the cash flow, right? But now, uh, when you look at the at the end of the day, uh, when when we look at the cash flow, so you have to look at uh, look in, the, in in the terms of return of investment, right? Now earlier you had seventy thousand seven thousand dollars invested in a property. Now we have only thirteen thousand dollars invested in the property. So even if I don't consider any cash flow on this property, just by paying down the mortgage, right? So if I have to let's say I did some calculation uh, for five years of return of investment, so I'm not, let's see if I consider, I'm still cash flowing on this property, but even if I don't consider cash flowing and just look at the mortgage pay down um, with the same, uh, uh, without even increasing rents, uh, the one, uh, the five year return that I'm getting is 90% and one year return I'm getting is around 14%. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. And uh, and, and uh, uh, what expected cash flow are, are, are you are you looking to have once you refinance? So once I refinance, the cash flow would be hundred and ten dollars, right? But okay. that's only leaving thirteen k in my property, and I'll definitely have a lot of room to increase my rent. Uh, and then, yeah, and uh, yeah. So what it allows me to do is uh, now, if I have to buy my another property, I don't have to wait for that seventy seven thousand dollars to save, right? I can just use my existing money, and same thing. The last step of the burr. It's just repeat, right? So you can repeat, yeah. Keep on repeating. Increase the velocity of your money, right? That is instead that. of letting it just sit there. Yeah. Yes, it's definitely a uh, bird strategy. Is definitely something that will allow you to expedite your uh, long-term rental portfolio, uh, so you don't have to uh, wait for accumulating that much of cash, right? You can just use this method to build your real estate portfolio in a short time time span, versus what you were supposed to do with the traditional uh, way of investing. Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly, exactly. Um, and tell me, how long did this whole process take you from start till till? Well, you're almost done. You mean you just have to refinance and then you could yes, six it, months. You know? Six months. Six okay. months. Yes, and that six months basically. Um, yeah, that six months. Uh, that that took me. There was one month. Uh, actually, uh, two months was for the permitting process itself, and. Uh, Last twenty two, I we definitely wasted twenty to thirty days at the end, and it's it it was not of any of my fault or contractor fault because when we were going for the inspection, the day of Edmonton is pretty busy nowadays, right? So the inspection dates that we were getting is was pretty like 
uh, we had to wait two to three weeks sometimes in some of the inspections that they were doing right so those definitely uh, those are definitely some things that uh, you have to uh, keep in uh, keep in mind and uh, even let's say if you finish in four months uh, depending upon which lender that you go to let's say if you go to bank uh, right traditional banks some banks don't allow you to refinance it uh, before six months criteria right uh, yeah six months criteria that they have so depending uh, depending upon who is your lender uh, if they don't allow you to finish it before like refinance it before six months even if you finish everything before that you still have to wait till the six months till six months finish it and is is that six months from um from you taking ownership and or not six months from you renting it out right uh, i believe the six uh, six months since the, you've taken the ownership yes okay yes okay. but again uh, uh, i would say consult your mortgage broker because oh. every bank is different or every lender are different yes yes yeah yeah uh and i know you said once you get this money out you're looking to just put it into the next property are you looking <laughs> to sort of repeat and duplicate this exact process with the exact yes. same criteria and just keep refining the process each time yes yes because uh, well as i mentioned earlier i still work full time right so i what i want is i some i want something uh, which i can do passively and this strategy allows me to do the same thing passively rather like uh, instead of quitting my job and uh, doing everything actively this this strategy does allow me right so it is to try and test your property uh, uh, strategy why not just leverage it right you definitely learn from each each of your experiences so l- use strategy learn from your experiences and just keep on repeating it yes yes yeah. yeah and um i know when you started this you started it in a hot market and now mm-hmm. the market's not so hot is yeah. there anything that you'd be doing differently between um your first deal and and now given the current state of the market i would definitely rely on uh, uh, some off market deals now right and that's what i'm that's what my focus going forward is that i'm going to uh, try to get some off market deals if possible right so uh, if i get some off market deals i i will be able to negotiate much more on uh, on those properties uh, so yeah working with wholesalers doing some wholesaling by myself getting those uh, lead generations and uh, and and with the with the slower market one thing that also comes uh, comes in your advantage is uh, the trades who were very difficult for you to uh, get hold of they will be available i wouldn't say easily but uh, it would be easier than uh, their availability and uh, the amount of money that they used to charge is definitely going to uh, lower down i i for the basement suite i had the you would be surprised the quotes that i was getting they were anywhere from $40,000 up to $150,000 right what so, what's a spread though <laughs> what a spread right so but the sweet spot was somewhere around uh, 60 65000 any anywhere from 60 to 70000 depending upon the market but now i i know that uh, because everything is getting a little slower uh, the price is definitely going to uh, decrease right and and from my next uh, projects uh, that that I'll be doing I won't I would not be hiring any general contractor for those because okay. that's what I've learned right for next uh, 4 5 months the amount of work that I put in in terms of learning all these things I'll be leveraging yeah. that uh, that that uh, knowledge to manage everything by myself so, so that that okay. that put something that I'll be doing differently. Okay, okay, and I'm not sure if you mentioned, but um, the basement of this current property was it was it um completely unfinished? Yes, it was, and and that was another okay. criteria that I was uh, also looking. Uh, I know that uh, there were uh, some uh, I don't know some YouTube videos that I have seen. Uh, uh, I believe I, I don't know if it was from Edmonton or Calgary, but people were saying that. Go with the finished basement, and then what you can do is you can just uh, uh, change it to uh, legal secondary seat easily, right? But uh, there are few things that uh, uh, that was recommended to me was when you go for a finished basement, right? First of all, you don't know what uh, like you don't know how your duct work and everything is going because in order to make your uh, basement, you need to know how your duct work is going, how your plumbing and everything is going, right? Uh, so. going fresh without having anything it definitely gives us better perspective of how we going to structure our basement second thing is is definitely going to decrease the cost of our renovation 
right? Uh, sorry, decrease the cost of renovation because there is nothing to demolish this at that yes. point of time. Because demolition definitely takes uh, a lot of time as well as labor. So it's going to cost you much more at the end of the day. So when we were buying this property, uh, we had that so criteria as well that let's buy something where something is like with the unfinished basement or if it's finished, it's not a lot. It's just the regular drywall, you know, flooring, something like that, right? Which is easier for us to uh, demolish. Okay. Yeah. And s since you didn't have a lot to demolish, did you have to still rent one of those those big um, those big bins? Uh, well, uh, my uh, because I was not the one who was demolishing it. It's sorry. So this basement had a drywall drywall against the foundation, but in between okay. it was pretty empty, right? So oh, there was see, still I demolition. See, okay. But it was okay. not that much of demolition that would need uh, require those big paints. So my contractor was putting everything on those black contractor packs and then uh, put everything in his truck and tore away. Right. So oh, he right. was also yeah. he was also trying to uh, reduce his cost at the end of the day. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay. And I guess lastly, when um when you're not investing, how how else are you spending your time? I know you work in full time and you invest in so. Uh, you're pretty tied up, but what what else do you do when you're not doing any of that? Okay, so uh, well, I I'm working full time, right? So most of the time of my day is taken by my uh, full time job. But when I'm not uh, uh, what you call working, I do listen to a lot of podcasts, read some books, and at the end of the day, uh, spend time with your family as well because all these uh, effort that you're putting is to make better life with your family, right? So. Uh, so spend a good uh, family time, uh, uh, good quality uh, time with your family, uh, and also go out, enjoy your life. Right? We have, we don't have uh, many uh, months with summer, right? So whenever you get chance to go out, yes. enjoy, enjoy nice weather, uh, right? We have, we have great city. We have a lot of uh, uh, like nature within our city, right? Just go and explore that. So those are the things that I, I pretty much do. Good, good. It sounds pretty balanced. And I think what, what that forces you to do is if you're spending time with your family, spending time going out, working your your your, your regular job and investing, um, you, you sort of have to take out the time that you spend dabbling on things that aren't going to get you anywhere. And when you're working on investing, it's either learning something, a skill that's going to help you or taking action and, you know, making sure that you're doing something productive. Um, yeah, not just scrolling through social media looking at so I, I do go <laughs> through social media because that's uh, that's the hard truth uh, of our lives nowadays right because uh, uh, all the things right uh, I connected to you with uh, initially with social media right so social, social media, media as long as you use it responsibly to, to benefit uh, to your own benefit it definitely comes in handy that's don't the key. Take, yeah don't let social media take over of your life so that's that's one thing that I definitely keep in mind Absolutely. Using social media, right? And not letting it use you. You have to use it responsibly um, and not just be scrolling down the rabbit hole, but actually using it for a specific purpose. I completely agree. It's it's a great tool to use because, yeah, you're right. That's how that's how we connected. So exactly. That's how you build your network, right? Uh, and that, yeah. uh, that, that's the if I have to give any tip, uh, the one th this is the same tip I was given by so many other investors uh, that uh, your network is your net worth, right? Uh, connect with as many people, like-minded people uh, as possible because uh, once uh, once you network, you will meet so many people, learn from their exp experiences, share your experiences, and that's how, that's how you grow, right? Because uh, at the end of the day, it uh, doesn't matter how many property you're going to get uh, unless and until you grow professionally as well as personally, uh, you you don't want to stay at the same place, right? So, absolutely. Speaking of which, where can listeners find out uh, more about you if they want to get in touch with you? Uh, Facebook would be the uh, uh, the easiest way uh, to reach out to me. So I'm I'm uh, pretty active on uh, social media, right? So if, uh, they can like if they want to reach out to me, Facebook would be the uh, easiest way to get hold of me. Okay, perfect. I'll be sure to um, leave your your info in in the description if people want to reach out to you um but vash thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to bring us all this value i really enjoyed the topic today i know not a lot of people are out there doing like working on the actual birth strategy right now um so 
yeah, I was really excited to have you on the show today. So thank you for taking the time out. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed uh, talking to you today. And whenever we meet, right, uh, whenever I get the chance to talk to you about how you are, uh, how you are in investing in real estate, right, uh, the way that you're evolving yourself as well, it's definitely uh, motivating uh, for me as well. So, yeah, it's it's definitely a pleasure talking to you all the time. And I'm definitely looking forward to our uh, future conversations as well. Thank you for tuning in to the Building Wealth Through Real Estate podcast. If you're interested in starting or growing your real estate business, then you definitely want to check out this video where I interview Jeremy Heeman. Also, if you're interested in learning how you can get rental properties with having zero money or needing financing, then check out this video where I interview Joey Critch. This is your host, Alray Noble, signing off.